Good morning. Welcome to Bransfield Evangelical Church. And a big welcome if this is the first time that you join us. We do hope that you will feel at home with us. And of course, welcome if to everyone who'd normally be sitting here Sunday in, Sunday out, how we miss being together, chatting over a coffee and giving each other a hug. I don't know what kind of week each of us had, but chances are it was another tiring week of lockdown. And maybe the worries of life and all the uncertainties surrounding the pandemic got to us um, a bit more than usual. Well, it's good that we're here because we're here today to just recenter our attention on God, on the God who's worthy of our praises. We're here to read from his word, to hear from his word, to sing to him. So let me just read a couple of verses from Psalm 147, which describe the kind of God that we're here to worship this morning and remind us that, yes, he is worthy of our praises. Psalm 147, from verse 1. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power, his understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. So let's now do exactly that. Let's sing to the Lord with grateful praise. But when 
as I ought Till then I would thy love proclaim with every fleeting breath and may the music of thy name refresh my soul in day refresh my soul in Good morning, everyone. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, my name is Peter. I'm the youth pastor at Busted, and I want to speak particularly to the kids. Now, uh, I don't know what your week's been like. I hope, I hope um, online school school's been going okay with you guys. How have you guys found it here? Quite busy, but quite fun. Yeah. Not fun on a single day. What? So, not entirely I'm convinced about online school. Not no? again. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> Doesn't want to do it again, I know, but it's what we have to do. But we're not going to think any more about that today. We are today. We're going to think about responses, and I guess that was a response, wasn't it? We had a happy response, um, a not very enthusiastic response. What is a response? A response is something that you do when something happens. Okay, and we're going to think about some things. So here's something that might happen to you. You might get a bad haircut. Okay, so getting a bad haircut. Can you hold that for me? Okay. Getting a bad hair, what's the response going to be? And I've got some responses here that we could choose. Okay, what about cheering? Would that be a good response? So if you've yes. got a bad haircut, no. cheering. No, why would you cheer if you have a bad haircut? Would you cheer? Yes. No. Would you yes. cheer? Okay, apparently no. someone would. Okay, okay. Not me. What about, so we're thinking no to cheering, no? Mm. What about putting on a plaster? Mm, no. Would that fix your bad haircut, putting on a plaster on? No. No, not a good response, not the right response. Okay, groaning. Do you no, groan no. about a haircut, yeah, maybe? Yeah. Have a have a shower? Yeah, oh, that would be nice. Yeah. No. Don't know, might help your haircut a little bit. Okay, like what about wearing a hat? Oh, yeah. that might work, because I know we'd see it. Okay, so if you get a bad, bad haircut, maybe a one response would be to wear a hat. Right, what else could happen to you? Oh, you could get extra homework extra homework Wait, were any of those responses good responses cheering would you cheer for if you got extra Yay! homework would you cheer no would you cheer if you got extra homework no what might you do have a shower yeah put a yes. plaster on no, no. Have a shower, so okay what about I'm this one have a shower. groaning groaning most people would groan if they've got I'll so most people would groan yeah if they got extra homework yeah i think that's the right response to that isn't it right okay falling in a muddy puddle oh what do you think the right really quite what would be the right response cheer. for this cheering cheering you might cheer if you fall in a muddy puddle right <laughs> no. Thank you so much. Put on a plaster. That's not really going to do anything. But having a shower. Yeah, have a shower. Get okay. Clean. That would be a good response. Oh, that would be the right response. If you fall in a muddy puddle, have a shower. So we've got yeah. two left. Cutting your finger and getting ice cream. And we've got two responses. Cheering and putting on a plaster. You would cheer if you got ice cream. Okay. So cheering for ice cream yes i would cheer for ice cream and if you get a cut on your finger you would put a plaster on so there we go we've managed to sort them all out and we've got the right response okay for the thing happening okay now why are we thinking about responses it's because do you remember we're thinking about the signs the seven signs that john writes about jesus performing miracles that show who he is well we're on to sign number three today and you find that in, in John chapter 5. And what happened was Jesus went to Jerusalem. Okay, we can pop these down now. Jesus went to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, there was a pool. And at this particular pool, lots of people who had problems, um, if they were ill or paralysed or um, things like that, they went to this pool. And then they believed that when the water all sort of churned up, the first person in the pool would get healed. Okay, so that's why they all stayed around this pool. 
And Jesus went along there and he found a guy, found a man, and he found that this man had been paralysed and he couldn't walk. And he had been like this for 38 years. That's a very long time, isn't it? Okay, that's a very long time. And Jesus said to him, pick up your mat and go. Pick up your mat and go. Because Jesus, Jesus was healing him. Because he could remember he couldn't walk. And now he could walk. Okay. So he did that. He was able to, to get up carry his mat and go. But there was a little bit of a problem. And that problem was that it was the Sabbath, okay? That was their holy day, the day when the Jewish people uh, weren't to do any work. And some of the religious leaders, they saw the man carrying his mat and they said, what are you doing carrying your mat? This is the Sabbath. Why are you carrying it? And the man said, oh, well, you know, it's not my fault. The man who healed me, he told me to pick up my mat. And then the religious leaders, well, then they said, well, who is this person? Who is this person? They, they wanted to sort this person out. They weren't happy. See, that was the right response to this man being healed. No. See, that was a good response. No, they didn't no. seem to care. No, 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 no. They didn't seem to care that the man had been healed. He couldn't walk for 38 years and nor he could walk. And all they were concerned about was the fact that he was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. And that wasn't, that isn't really a rule that you find in the Bible. It's just something extra that they had decided. Now God did say to the Jewish people that they were to rest on the Sabbath. That was to be a holy special day. But he hadn't said, you know, he hadn't made a whole list of different things that you couldn't do, like picking up your mat. So that wasn't a good response. And then Jesus saw the man later. And then the man realised and found out it was Jesus. Um, and Jesus, you know, Jesus told him to, you know, to stop sinning now. You know, he, Jesus wanted him to repent. But what the man did was he went to the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, and said, it was Jesus who told me to pick up my mat. Do you think that was the right response? No, no. That wasn't a good response either. And what Jesus said to the religious leaders was this, you see, um, they didn't want him working on, a, on the Sabbath, but Jesus said, my father never stops working, so I keep working too. And this made the religious leaders even more angry with Jesus. Okay, And this is when they, they started trying to kill him. Uh, and this is what they said. They said, first Jesus was breaking the law about the Sabbath day. Now he says that God is his own father, making himself equal with God. And that is true. Jesus is equal with God, and that's what he was saying. But their response, it wasn't good, was it? And even today, we get different responses to Jesus. Okay, Some people respond to Jesus in the right way. People, they trust in Jesus, and they repent, and they want to go his way, not their own way. Okay? And other people, they don't respond in the right way to Jesus. They, they just don't think, no, I'm not interested in Jesus. No. And they go their own way. Yeah, they just want to go their own way. So, this is what we're thinking about today. We're thinking about the right response. The right response to Jesus. So let's just pray and ask that we would all have the right response to Jesus. Okay? You ready? P R A Y. Okay, God, we thank you for today, and I pray that you would help each one of us to have the right response to Jesus. Help us to trust and obey him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Peter. The passage that Alistair will unpack for us later in the service in Ephesians 4 is all about God's gifts to his children for the building of the church. So we thought it would make sense today to talk about one of the ways that we can build each other up in um, fellowship in, um, as we study the word together, which is meeting one-to-one -one with other brothers and sisters. 
and Christy and Ruth have kindly agreed to share their experience of one-to-ones with us. So let's watch um, a video of them sharing their experience now. So one of the great things about being a Christian is that we're always learning. And sometimes when you actually sit down with another Christian and just reflect on what's happening in your life, you'll be surprised at how much the Holy Spirit has been doing and what he's been teaching both of you. So over the past years, I've really benefited from meeting up with other people from church. I've met up with Ruth and I've also been reading Genesis with Addie. And I've really loved just becoming friends, but also, yeah, as I said, reflect upon your Christian journey. I think it's really helped me to connect my everyday life with my relationship with God. When it comes to work, family, friendships, and big and small challenges. You know, sometimes we have an easy week and other times we have big decisions to make. But when you have, um, when you have a person you trust and you can open up to, when you do face challenges, you have somebody you can pray with and bring things into perspective and just feel a lot more equipped to go out into the world and face life. It also helps me to feel like I'm part of the church as I go about my everyday life. So I would really encourage you, no matter what age you are or what stage you are or whether you're shy or extroverted, to meet up with somebody else from church and just ask them if they want to read the Bible and you can make it your own. You can, as I said, make it more like a Bible study or just meet up for coffee. But like Graham was saying last week, we are a church family and we don't need to face life's challenges alone. And lastly, it helps me to be excited about being a Christian, and even when difficult things happen, it's an opportunity to submit to God or, or learn something, and also take part in other people's lives and both be able to comfort them, but also celebrate when good things happen. So, as I said, go for it. Hello, my name is Ruth and I'm a member of Brunsfield Evangelical Church. I'm part of a growing number of people in the church who takes part in one-to-one -one Bible studies. Paul told Titus that truth leads to godliness. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that the truth can only be found in the Word of God. It's such a pleasure to choose a book or passage from the Bible and talk it through with someone else knowing that it makes a godly difference to our lives, transforming us to be more like Christ. The good thing about studying the Bible is that you will never run out of subject matter. From Genesis to Revelation, there is every situation relevant to our lives and the choice is truly endless. One-to-one -one Bible studies are easy to organise as well as there are only two of you to find the time to study. However, it is a discipline to prioritise time, as well as not be afraid of choosing difficult subjects or books of the Bible. I've derived personal benefit in listening to those I do Bible study with, as they see things from a different viewpoint. And as we discuss, we learn from each other. The Bible comes alive when we combine our own experiences and talk them through with another person. We also learn more about each other as we walk the Christian life together. Having these Christ-focused conversations means that we can more easily put into practice those truths we have found in Scripture. Paul told the Philippians that they were to reflect, meditate and think about those things which were true, right, pure, lovely and admirable. By emulating him and learning to put these characteristics into practice, they would discover the presence of God in their lives. 
It has been such a privilege for me to study the Bible with others, knowing that to do so is of far more lasting importance than anything else. In doing so, I grow closer to the Lord Jesus and know more about our wonderful God. Christian, Ruth, thank you so much for taking the time to record these videos for us and for, for sharing just your, your experience of what being in a one-to-one -one is like. Wouldn't it be amazing to see more of these relationships grow in our church and see more of us just um, take up the opportunities that being part of our local church gives us to um, grow in fellowship and grow in the word. So I'm going to invite you to get in touch with Graham or Alistair. I'm going to invite all of us um, to do that and let them know, one, whether you would like to be in a one-to-one. -one. We would love to facilitate that for you. And two, whether you would like to join a training group um, to learn how to organize and, and lead um, one-to-ones um, better or how to do it at all if you've never done it before. So please do get in touch with Alistair or Graham. You'll find their email addresses on our website if you don't have them. And I'm now going to just mention a few things which are happening in the life of our church over the next few weeks. Starting from um, today, tonight, we are meeting as usual for our evening service. It's going to be on Zoom. It's at 6 p.m. Graham is going to um, preach to us from the book of Isaiah. And we're also going to have a chance to hear from Thomas and Addy, who are finally um, going to Senegal next Friday for their mission trip with EMI. So please do come along so that we can hear from them and pray with them. And we're going to pray for them in a minute too. This week, as usual, we're meeting on Mondays and on Monday and Thursday to pray together. That's on Zoom at 8 p.m. Please do come along if you can. And then later in the month, on Thursday the 28th, there's going to be a social for students on Zoom. We recognize lockdown can be um, lonely and challenging, and it's, of course, a very different um, way of experiencing university than normal. So we'd love for as many students as possible to just come to um, socialize together. There will also be a short devotion. Please get in touch with Alistair if you would like to join. That's Thursday the 28th for students. And then finally, just a heads up that the um, evangelization team, evangelism team, are planning to run a Life Explored course starting on the 2nd of February. Life Explored is a great course to share the gospel with people. So please do pray for it. There will be more details shared in due course, but you can already get in touch with Alistair if you would like to know more about it. And of course, we should all start thinking about who we could invite to the course. As I said, it'll start on the 2nd of February. It's called Life Explored, and it'll run, um, I think, all the way up to Easter, more or less. Let's now bow our heads and pray. Father, as we read, you know each star by its name. Father, as we are possibly overwhelmed by um, what we see happening around us at the moment, it's so reassuring, it gives us so much strength to know that you are in control because you are the God who created the universe, you are the God who designed everything, including us, who knew us before we were born. And so, Father, as we um, look around and are perhaps confused, as we look around and are perhaps overwhelming, whether that's because of the pandemic or um, because of anything that's going on in our private lives. Father, we pray for healing. We pray for restoration. And we pray for that in our lives and we pray for that um, for our country and for our world. And Father, we pray that in the midst of all these um, circumstances, of all these uncertainty, Father, we pray that your name 
will be glorified. We know that you're powerful, Father, to work in a broken world through broken and confusing circumstances, Father, to make your name known. Father, we pray that you will use everything that is going on so that more people will learn about you, more people will run to you and open their hearts to you. Father, we pray that what is happening just now will be a wake-up call for those who don't know you, but perhaps even for us as your children if we need it, Father, that we should not be relying on earthly things, that we should humble ourselves, Father, not rely on ourselves, on our human skills, Father, but simply on you, on our God, and just respect and just accept your your authority, Father, and just come to you with humility and ask you to be um, tools in your hands, Father, and to be, just pray that yeah, your spirit will help us be obedient to you, Father. Father, we confess that too often we don't do it and that we are too arrogant. We think we're self-sufficient. So, Father, may your spirit work in our lives, change us and make us more similar to, to Jesus, Father, who showed us how it is that we should live, Father, to glorify you. Father, we really ask you that you'll help us put you at the centre, Father, as children of yours. We want to be of example to those around us who do not know you, Father, so that they can see um, that there is a different way of living, Father, which revolves around you and not us. Father, we know that many people within our congregation are unwell, there are many that we won't know about, or we won't know the details, but Father, you do. So we pray for everyone who's struggling with health, physical or mental, with family issues, with financial problems, Father. You know them. We pray that um, their needs will be known to at least a few of us, Father, and that we will be able to look after each other, to support each other, and most importantly, Father, to point each other to you um, in these times of, of need. And Father, a few people that we want to um, name specifically and we want to pray about are the Pontin family um, and their um, struggle with health. We pray for Finley Houston's family, Father, as they grieve. And we pray for Thomas and Addie as they um, get ready um, to, to finally leave and go to Senegal. We pray for them, for their trip, Father, that you'll protect them, that everything will go smoothly. And we pray for them as they settle and as they start working on their projects, Father. We really pray that um, their contribution, that they will be a blessing um, to the people that they will come across, to the um, projects that they will work on and to the people who will benefit from these projects, Father. And we pray that through their work, through their presence, where they will be, Father, um, people will, will just get to know you and yeah, surrender their lives to you. Father, we ask you to bless the rest of this service, Father. We um, ask you that we will hear from you today, we will learn from you today, and we will um, just come out of this service, Father, um, changed, having committed to um, become more similar to Jesus in our um, walk as Christian. Amen. We're now going to sing another song before David and Michelle um, bring us our readings today, and then Alice that will bring us the sermon. Lord, I 
Michelle and David, and our reading today is from Ephesians 4, 7 to 16. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. 
From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And now I'm just going to pray for Alistair uh, before he comes to speak. Dear Lord, uh, we pray for Alistair as he comes to bring us your word. And we thank you for the time and effort that he's put into preparing this sermon. Uh, we pray that he would help us to understand this passage more. We pray, Lord, that we would still our hearts as we listen to this sermon. May we tune out any distractions that are around us and focus in on what you're teaching us. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, David and Michelle, and for everyone else who's been involved in the service. My name is Alistair. I'm the assistant pastor here at Bronsfield, and it is my absolute joy to open up this passage of Ephesians 4 to us. But I want you to think back as we begin. Maybe one of the things that you probably remember growing up as a child is that proud day when you and your siblings were all lined up ready to have your height marked on the doorpost. Normally it was in the kitchen or in the, the cupboard door frame. Now I, I'm from a family of three boys, so we can get quite competitive at times. And I remember puffing out my chest, standing as tall as I possibly could, just to see how much I'd grown over the last few months. So you'd stand with your back to the post, and your, my, in my case, my mum would put the pencil on top of my head, ready to make the mark. And before she'd even made the line, the question would inevitably come, have I grown? When we're younger, we do everything we can to grow. We are fascinated with being older, with being taller, with being big. How does that happen? Well, if we eat enough good food, if we get enough good exercise, and if we believe what our parents tell us, if we don't eat too many sweets. Children want to grow, and that growth is a good thing. Now carry that same thought across to the local church. How do we, as a church, grow? I don't mean numerically, because numbers are no indication of how we're actually doing as a church. I mean spiritually. How does the church grow? Well, the message that we hear ringing through the passage that was read to us just a moment ago is that we, the church, are gifted to grow. We have received gifts from Christ that we need to help us grow in unity and in maturity so that we can, beco that we can become the church that Jesus Christ has called us to be. The spiritual growth of the local church does not come about by following the newest trends or by listening to a particular leader. The church grows as every single member uses their God-given gifts to serve the church, which is built on the Bible, the very words of God. Now, the main focus of this passage this morning is not us as individuals, but instead it is about the local church and we are gifted to grow. Now, to help us see that this morning, we will ask two questions of the text. And the first question is, what were we given to grow? In verses 7 to 11, what were we given to grow? <clears throat> Read verse 7 with me. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now, grace is a word that we throw around a lot in Christian circles. You've probably heard it to explain God's goodness and kindness to his people. Ian Hamilton, a minister and theologian, says this about grace. Grace is God's undeserving kindness to judgment deserving sinners. Now, where we hear the word grace, Christians stand up and we scream, yes, amen. We have been given grace by God. And we usually, we usually think about grace in terms of our salvation, that wonderful, miraculous wonder of forgiveness that has been given to us through Jesus and his death on the cross. But that's not what Paul is actually getting at here in Ephesians. Looking at the context of the whole book, 
and the way Paul uses the word elsewhere in Ephesians, the grace that he is speaking of is and must be gifts given to us by God. But Jesus isn't like Santa, who takes in a wish list once a year and dishes out good gifts to those who happen to make it onto the nice list and gives coal to those naughty children. No, God in his immeasurable grace calls sinners like you and me to become Christians. But that grace doesn't stop there. Because as verse 7 says, God continues to equip his people by his grace. He gives us gifts. Now maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, this, this doesn't really apply to me because I have no gifts. We can often think that gifting must equal platform and recognition. We equate the gifts with the upfront stuff that we see going on in church or the miraculous gifts that we read elsewhere in the New Testament. And those are part of it. But thinking that you're not gifted just because you're not preaching or you're not leading a, a ministry. Thinking that you're not gifted because you're not doing what someone else is doing is wrong. Look at what the Bible says in verse 7 to each one of us. Friends, each and every one of you listening in this morning is gifted by Christ to build up the church. No exceptions. And to back this up, Paul quotes from Psalm 68 and relates it specifically to Jesus' work and tells us how Jesus is able to give gifts to his people. Paul uses this psalm to describe the ascension of Jesus that we read about in the book of Acts and how because of his reigning victory over our enemies, he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And by grace, he gives as gifts. When Jesus took on flesh or descended to the lower earthly regions, as verse 9 says, he stooped from his place of glory with the Father in heaven and became one of us, yet was without sin. And through his death on the cross, he defeated the spiritual forces that wage war against humanity every single day. He defeated sin. He defeated death. And after his ascension, when he returned to the Father, he sat at his right hand and is now reigning in absolute control over all things, as verse 10 says. Friends, this is the Savior that we serve. And as if that wasn't glorious enough, he has given each of us gifts. But he has also given particular gifts He's gifted particular leaders to the body of Christ. And that is what we see in verse 11. Christ has gifted the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers to the church. Now, the pastors and teachers, those are one office. And are what we currently understand to be pastors and elders. But why does Paul mention these four leaders? Well, if you think of the global church as a building, it will help us understand. You see, the apostles and the prophets are the foundation of the church. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. Read with me. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. The apostles here in this passage are the 12 apostles and Paul himself. They are the ones who knew Jesus, who saw him and who were called to be sent ones. That's what apostle means. They are the foundations of the church, which is ultimately built on Jesus Christ. The prophets were those who spoke the word of God to the people of God. And again, remembering the context of Ephesians 2.20, the prophets were the original New Testament prophets who taught the church. 
So if they are the foundation of this house, the body of Christ, the next leaders are the frame in, put in place to help the building grow. The evangelists are those who took the gospel to the people who don't know Jesus. And there are those who continue this work on a daily basis in their friends and family circles, on street corners and in marketplaces all over the world. And there are those who are especially gifted in this phenomenal work. But if you think that this is a get out of evangelism free card, you are wrong. That's not the case. This does not mean that the rest of us can sit back and leave the work of the Great Commission to a select few of evangelists. Every single Christian, according to Matthew 28, is called to share the gospel. And then we have the pastors. Those whose job it is to care for the Lord's people and to teach them. Do you notice one thing? That, you, that connects all of these offices. Well, it's the word of God. The apostles and the prophets built the church on the word that they had received from Jesus. The evangelists share the good news of Jesus as we find it in the Bible. And the role of any pastor, any elder, is primarily to be a teacher of God's word. Now, this is really important because if we misunderstand this, if we move away from the Bible, then, friends, we are done for. Because we're not built on the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ and the foundations of solid teaching. To be a local church family that grows in our unity and maturity, we don't need to look at the world And do the newest trendy thing. We don't need growth strategies. And we shouldn't be trying to become more like the world to seem more normal. If we want to be a church that grows in unity and in maturity, then we need to get our heads in our Bibles. We need to know the word. We need to live in the word and use the gifts that Christ has given us to be taught by the leaders that God has given us and to live for Jesus. By grace, Christ has given each and every single one of us gifts. But maybe you're left thinking, why? Why did Jesus do that? What's the point of him giving me a gift? That's the second question we need to ask of this passage. Why were we given them? Verses 12 to 16. Why were we given them? When thinking about every Christian receiving a gift, the temptation might be to think about the how and why to use those gifts merely in an individualistic way. But we're not called and gifted to make ourselves great. We're not called and gifted for ourselves to be the focus. This whole passage is about how we can use our individual gifts for the upbuilding of the local church. Even the leaders in verse 11, they weren't called and gifted so that they could be put on a pedestal. They're not perfect, but so that they could do all the work in the church themselves. Their role is, verse 12, to equip his people, that is God's people, for works of service. And this is what we call every member ministry. As elders, we believe that each one of you is gifted. And our role is to equip and enable you to serve the church with your gift. As a church, we are gifted to grow. Now this flies right in the face of something that is such a relevant temptation for us at the moment during another lockdown. It is so easy to roll out of bed on a Sunday morning, turn on YouTube and then not think about church until the next Sunday comes around. Consumer Christianity is always a temptation, but maybe it's even more of a danger now than it was before. 
as Christians, we weren't called to sit and twiddle our thumbs. We were called by God to glorify him and to serve him. And that means that every one of us should be using our gifts in the church. That every one of us should be sharing the gospel and reaching the lost. And we get this repeated again in verse 16. The church grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Friends, if you're not serving in the church at the moment, why not? Or if you're unsure which area you're gifted in, well, come and speak to myself or any one of the other elders. Our role is to equip you to serve so that we as a church can be built up to maturity and unity. The way we serve can look different for each one of us. And age is no limit. We are not a young people's church. Are you older and have been a Christian for a long time? Don't sit back, but why not use that experience and get in a one-to-one -one with a younger person? As you grow and study the Bible together, as you share life with one another, you will both be blessed. Are you a young person and you've got a busy work schedule? You've got a busy family life. Maybe you've got a busy social calendar. Well, the Bible gives nobody an excuse not to serve their local church. We are all to serve by using our gifts out of love to build up the church. Maybe you're able to serve in welcoming people to church in inviting people to the Life Explored course coming up so that they too can hear about Jesus, in sharing the gospel with people every single day, or by encouraging people and calling them up during lockdown to see how they're doing and how you can pray for them. This is all of our job as Christians who are gathered together as one family in Brunsfield Evangelical Church. Every single one of us should engage in ministry because each of us have been gifted to grow. And Paul gives us three reasons for this every member ministry in the local church in verses 12 and 13. Firstly, so that we would all reach unity in faith and full knowledge of God's Son. Secondly, maturity. And finally, so that we may attain to the fullness of Christ. Now again, remember the focus of this passage is congregational, not individualistic. So our maturity and unity as a church is measured by how our relationship as a congregation is with Jesus. If we grow in our maturity and our unity, then we will become more like Christ. We will attain to the full measure of Christ, which is the goal. Now, what does that look like? Well, verse 14, read with me. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. A church that is equipped to serve through the teaching of God's word will not be infants, but mature. A church that grows in maturity and in unity will not be tossed to and fro by every wind of teaching. A church that grows in maturity and unity will be discerning about what they listen to and who they follow. So flip that around. What does a church look like that is not based on the Bible? And that doesn't focus on growing in maturity and unity. Well, they're like a rubber dinghy in the middle of a rainstorm caught at sea. Imagine a blow-up lilo that you use at the seaside. They are fun to relax on and lie in the water for a while, but they are not built to keep you afloat in the middle of a storm. A Christian, a church that is not rooted in their theology... A church that doesn't strive for maturity and unity is like a lilo being tossed to and fro in a vicious storm. 
And notice the warning there, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. This is why it is so important to be careful who we listen to. If we listen to just anyone speaking about the Bible and take their word for it, we are not being mature. If we're sick, we wouldn't go to just anyone for a diagnosis or a course of treatment. We would want to make sure that we're going to a doctor, someone who knows their stuff, who's been to medical school, someone who has good knowledge of our symptoms. And if we do that with our physical health, we pay close attention to the advice we're listening to, to the people we're speaking to. Why would we not do it with our spiritual health? Because our spiritual health lasts for eternity. Friends, there are countless false doctrines and false teachers all over the world who would seek to distract you from the truth and draw our attention away from Christ. It's tempting because we all want to think that everything will be fine. We want to think that we will have our best life now, that our prosperity is the focus of life. But Paul says that such departures are, verse 14, deceitful schemes. Think back to the context of Ephesus. This city filled with pagan worship and idols. Paul is calling this church to be discerning to know what they believe and why they believe it so that they can stand up against the onslaught of attacks that will come their way. And our context today isn't much different, really. We're surrounded by different religions, different ideas, and even different theological schools of thought and false gospels. The call is the same. Be discerning, do not be caught off guard and be tossed to and fro by every new teaching that comes your way. Our role as Christians, according to verse 15 and 16, is to speak the truth in love and to build up the church in love. All the use of our gifts are worthless utterly worthless if they're not being used in love. Go later on and read 1 Corinthians 13 and you'll see that very clearly. This means that we need to hold each other accountable, that we will speak to each other about things in our lives that should not be there and we will do it out of a deep love and care for people so that, verse 15, We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Friends, Jesus has gifted each and every one of us for growth. Each of us has a part to play in the growth of the local church, not the numerical growth, but the growth in unity and maturity so that we can attain to the full, the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Think back to the markings on the doorpost when you were a child. Imagine going back to that house years later. You've probably grown a fair bit since then. I know I have. But now think if it were possible to do the same with the church and our spiritual growth. Would we be able to see a difference in our growth in maturity and unity as a local church over the last 50 years? Over the last 20 years? Over the last five years? What about over these last 10 months of lockdown? Friends, we have been gifted for growth. But each of us needs to use our gifts to build up the church. To actively serve with the goal of growing in our maturity and unity as a church family. 
You are gifted to help Brunsfield grow. And so let me leave you with a question this morning. What are you doing to help the church grow in maturity, in unity, and to become the bride of Christ that Jesus has called us to be? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that by your grace you have called us to be Christians. But Father, we thank you for the wonderful news that even more than that, your grace doesn't stop there, but you have given us gifts so that we can serve your church. Father, forgive us for the times where our goal has not been to serve, but to consume. Forgive us for the times where we have kept our gifts to ourself and not sought to grow the church in unity, in maturity, so that we would become the bride that you have called us to be. Father, help us all think about how we can serve. Help us all figure out the areas in which you've gifted us so that we can build up this local church that is Bronzefield Evangelical Church. Father, we ask all of this for your glory and in the precious name of our wonderful Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, we're now going to sing our final song of the service, Yet Not I, But Christ Through Me. And here's just some of the lyrics from the first verse. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace.
This is the end of our service. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And as ever, if you would like to discuss anything that's been said this morning or anything else at all, please do not hesitate to um, just reach out to us via our website or just get in touch if you have our phone numbers. Just two more verses from Psalm 147 before we go. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. May we be people that the Lord delights in this week. Let's fear him and let's put our hope in his unfailing love. May God bless the rest of your day.